All right, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to get into Joshua chapter 8. We're going to have the victory over AI, and we're going to talk about the plans for victory here in the first two verses where God is going to encourage Joshua and give him instructions. So we'll just jump straight in. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you, and arise, go up to AI. See, I have take, I have given you into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves, lay an ambush for the city behind it. So it is often most difficult to regain lost ground such as Ai. When we have failed at some point in our Christian lives, we need to know how to get back on track. And this was the first key to regaining victory. They had to receive encouragement from God. And though Israel stumbled through Akan's sin, as shown in Joshua chapter 7, they dealt with the failure and now had to move on. And what is past is past. We must deal with it before God in repentance and dying to self, and then look forward to what He has for us right now. And God wants us to use our failures in a good way, and to use them as a foundation for a great victory in the Lord. So God wasn't despondent or dispre- or you know depressed, and He didn't want Joshua or the nation of Israel to be either. Now it was time to get busy and set about being victorious for the Lord because he has not abandoned them. So God allows them to keep the spoil from the city of Ai and how foolish the sin of Akan seems now, right? He could have had all that his heart desired if only he waited on the Lord for it. So God gives Joshua a plan for conquering the city of Ai and now he must follow it. When we need to regain the victory, we must follow God's plan, not our own. And how do we know what God's plan is? You got to get into the word. You can't just make it up. So fear not, that's great news. There is a remedy for sin and it's called an altar. So God provided for our sin even before Adam, right? He told him not to be dismayed. God never discourages his people from making progress. The worst mistake of all is not to try again. So he says to take all the people, and there are lessons to be learned here, and have given, notice the past tense, it is a done deal, Romans chapter 4 verse 17, just as he had done to Satan. So God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him, God, right? So they marched 15 miles from Gilgal to Ai. Let's take verses 3 through 8, plans made for an ambush upon Ai. So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all but all of you be ready. Then I and all the people who are with me will approach the city, and it will come about when they come out against us at the first, that we shall flee before them. For they will come out again after us till we have drawn them from the city. And for they will say they are fleeing before us as at the first. Therefore we will flee before them, and you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord you shall do. See, I have commanded you. So this time Joshua does not send just 3,000 men as before in chapter 7 verse 4. Now he sends 30,000 mighty men of valor. When we need to regain victory, they must use every resource and the best resources for victory. And so though God had given Joshua the general plan of uh, chapter 8 verse 2, he left it up to Joshua's experience and sanctified common sense to lay out the specific plan of battle. So they marched 15 miles from Gilgal to Ai, the special force to seal off behind Ai, the path to Bethel about two miles to the west. And this would also prevent a surprise attack from Bethel. And the main force was going to proceed up the valley to challenge Ai and to feign a retreat, right? They were going to fake running away. And they were going to exploit AI's overconfidence because last time they ran away and were defeated, this time they're going to run away and get ambushed. And so the men of AI will think this is still chapter 7, but they don't know, right, what's going to happen here in chapter 8 for us. <clears throat> so the SEAL team here is going to take the city and they're going to seal off the ambush. 
All right, let's say verses 9 and 10, Joshua stays with the people. Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. Then Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, and he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai. So Joshua was especially near his people during this crucial time of trying to regain victory. The people needed to know that he was near and they needed to follow his leadership. And if we will regain victory, we must live with and follow Jesus, who is our Joshua. He is always near to us at these crucial times in our Christian life and always goes first to lead us into battle. So the same location as Abram's altar before and after Egypt and Joshua lodged with his army as David uh, and you can also reference David when he remained in Jerusalem when he encountered uh, Bathsheba all right let's take verses 11 through 13 preparations for battle Joshua and the people do exactly what the Lord commanded them and all the people of war who are with him went up and drew near and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai now the valley lay between them and Ai and he took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city and when they had set the people all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west side of the city Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley So if Israel will regain victory, they must take the offensive. They don't wait for AI to bring the battle to them. Bring the battle to AI. And we often see the battle against sin in mainly negative terms about what not to do. But we must also take the offensive against the powers of darkness and temptation and be busy about doing what the Lord would have us to do. All right, let's take verses 14 through 17. The ambush works. The fighting men of Ai leave the city. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle. He and all of his people at an appointed place before the plain. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them. Them. And they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. So the men of Ai tried the exact same strategy against Israel as before. And generally, Satan will stick with his strategy against us until it doesn't work anymore. And God directed Joshua to use a completely different strategy against Ai. When we see the diversity of God's methods, we remember it is because he is a personal God. Right? Those that are in the most danger are the least aware of it here. All right, let's take verses 18 through 29. Ai is totally defeated and burnt to the ground. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand towards Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand towards the city. And those in ambush arose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand. And they entered the city and took it and hurried to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, and they saw, and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven, so they had no power to flee this way or that way, and the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on their pursuers. Now, when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them. So they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying of all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they pursued them, and when they had all fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. And so it was that all who fell that day, both men and women, were twelve thousand, all the people of Ai, for Joshua did not draw back his hand, with which he stretched out the spear, until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the livestock and the spoil of the city Israel took as booty for themselves, according to the word of the Lord, which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to the city. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until evening. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise it over over it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. 
So the victory of God's judgment is complete because of God's faithfulness to Israel and Israel's faithfulness to God. This was not a halfway victory. If Israel will regain victory, they must shown, show no mercy to their enemy, but crush the enemy completely at every opportunity. And we can summarize the keys of victory from this chapter. We need to be encouraged. We need to follow the Lord's plan. Use every resource and the best resources. Live with and look to Jesus Christ. We need to go on the offensive and show no mercy to your enemy. So, so far, Israel's experience is an illustration of their whole history and the spiritual history of many Christians. Obedience followed by victory. Victory followed by blessing. Blessing followed by pride and disobedience. Disobedience followed by defeat. Defeat followed by judgment. Judgment followed by repentance. Repentance followed by obedience. And obedience followed by victory. And the cycle continues. So the spear is an uh, offensive weapon. And uh, the Rephidim where Aaron and Hur hold up Moses' hands. Look back at Exodus 17 verses 12 through 13. That was Joshua's training ground at that point. And since the men actually had to fight, they had earned their reward. The laws containing or concerning the spoils are covered in Numbers 31 verses 9 through 54. So it is too bad that Akan hadn't waited to take his spoils because he could have had everything that he wanted at this point. And cursed is anything that hangs on a tree, right? They hung the king from the tree. And notice Deuteronomy 21 verses 22 and 23 in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. All right, let's take verses 30 and 31, where an altar is built at Mount Ebal. Now Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, over which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. So this is a fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28. There the Lord told Israel that when they come to the promised land to come to these mountains, build an altar, sacrifice to the Lord, and read the law. And we see an appropriate act of worship and consecration unto God following a great victory. God always should get the glory. Even when men looked at the altar, they would not see elaborate carvings, though beautiful, drawing attention to man's work. Right? It had to be whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. So let's look at Shechem real quick. That was where 600 years earlier, Abraham had built his first altar. It's where Jacob, while fleeing from Laban, carried the teraphim, his father-in-law's stolen goods. It's where Joseph sought his brothers before going over to Dothan. It's where he was sold into slavery and where he was buried. And it's where Jacob dug a well and where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So in the valley, uh, it is north uh, Mount Abal, it is 3,077 feet above sea level. Uh, south is Mount Gerizim at 2,890 feet above sea level. And they form an amphitheater 500 yards apart at the bottom, one and a half miles at the top. And both mean barren, right? Altar is at the site of the curses, not the blessings. The altar is made to deal with the curse. So this was predicted by Moses... In Deuteronomy 27 through chapter 30, uh, three times it ma- uh, mentions unhewn stones in Scripture. Uh, Exodus 20 verse 35, Deuteronomy 27 verse 5, and Joshua chapter 8 verse 31. God's workmanship is not to be polluted by man's additions. And is, this is also a denial of humanism, right? The peace offerings were shared in Leviticus 7 verse 15, the communion or koinonia. So knowledge demands action in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verses 26 through 28. Let's look at verses 32 through 35 where blessings are read from Mount Gerizim and curses from Mount Abal. And there in the presence of the children of Israel he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses which he had written. Then all Israel with their elders and officers and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front at Mount Abal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before. 
that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the books of the law, the blessings and the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with all the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. So in this act of obedience, we see Joshua as a man of the book, obeying the command of Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. We also see Israel as a people of the book, ordering their lives after God's word. And this was even at a cost or inconvenience. The distance from Ai to Abal and Gerizim was a long way to move all the tribes of Israel at some 20 to 25 miles. And this was a beautiful place to do this, and the whole nation could hear the reading of the law. The area has a natural amphitheater effect because of the contour of the hills. And according to Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, the altar was built on the mountain of cursing Mount Abal. We need the covering sacrifice exactly at the point where our sin and failures are revealed and God's curse is pronounced on our sin. This event at this place shows that Israel controls the middle of Canaan and the highlands. The rest is a matter of taking advantage of this strategic position. So in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, Joshua 24, verse 26, you're going to have that fourth public monument at Gilgal, the crossing in chapter 4, verse 20, the Valley of Accor, which is the judgment of sin in chapter 7, verse 26, and the entrance to Ai, victory upon repentance in chapter 8, verse 29. And so in verse 33, you're going to have two groups, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin were on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing. These had Rachel or Leah as their mother. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali on Mount Abal, the Mount of Cursings, right? The Mount Abal, uh, these had handmaid Zilla or Billa as their mother, except for Reuben and Zebulun. Reuben had forfeited his status as firstborn by sinning against his father in Genesis 35, verse 22, and that's also covered again in Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4. And you can also reference Deuteronomy 28, verse 64. And so the law is not read until there was an altar, first mentioned in Joshua. There must be a remedy present for your failure to keep the law. Notice that the altar is on Mount Ebal, not Gerizim. And this is all that Shechem, um, this is all at Shechem. This is Genesis country, right? This will later become the capital of the Samaritans in John chapter 4. And the well was between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Mount Ebal, the curses of the law. Mount Gerizim, the humanism of works. Right? He rather pointed to neither, but he points to himself. And the ark not mentioned in Joshua, um, now that the law has been ratified. And you have the sojourner. Uh, notice Leviticus chapter 19, verse 34. And it's interesting that some of the groups who are drawn to put themselves under the law rarely include the cursings with the blessings. Right? We are not under the law. And you can see the book of Galatians for that. <clears throat> and notice... In verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel with the women, the little ones, and the strangers that were conversant among them. And so have you read God's word to your family? And that ties up Joshua chapter 8. Next time, we're going to, in uh, chapter 9, we're going to get into honor amidst deception and an alliance is formed. Yep, we'll get into that next time. Thank you for joining me.